namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Good evening, everyone. Okay, we've been studying the greater discourse on the destruction of craving, the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta. This is Sutta number 38 in the Middle Length Discourses. And last week I spoke about the sequence of dependent origination. And I explained the different methods of explanation according to the system of treatment that's come down within the Pali commentaries of the Theravada school using that chart, that table. Then just out of curiosity, we have in our library the four volumes of the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashyam. <laughs> this is the great Abhidharma work of the Northern Buddha school, the Savastivada school, which flourished in Kashmir in northwestern India. And I wanted to see, take a look and see how they treat dependent origination. And I found so many of the methods, well, can't say so many, there are just a few methods, but there's such a degree of correspondence and agreement with the method of treatment in the southern school of Buddhism, which flourished in south-southern Asia, that we can conclude that these methods of analysis, that they were not created by Buddha Gosa or by later Pali commentators, but they must have come from very early Buddhist methods of analysis. Okay. Okay, it says, Pratitya Samutpada can be divided into two parts. Okay, there's past existence, which are factors one and two, that's ignorance and the volitional formations and its effects, factors three to seven. That would be the factors from feeling, I'm sorry, consciousness, name and form, the six sense bases, six contact. Help me, please. (laughs) Consciousness, name and form, the six sense bases, contact, feeling. Right. Then the causes of future existence, factors eight to ten, craving, clinging, existence, and then future existence, factors eleven, twelve, that is birth and aging and death. Okay, so this is exactly in agreement with the analysis in the Pali tradition. Okay, then the explanations of the factors. Ignorance is, in the previous life, the state of defilement. The sankharas are, in a previous life, the state of action. Consciousness is the skandhas at conception. This not completely in agreement because the Pali tradition would say, in fact, the suttas would say that consciousness is really just the consciousness at conception and throughout life. The nama rupa is from this moment on the series until the production of the six sense bases. Okay, then the six sense bases are, you know, the five sense bases plus the mind base. Then there is contact. Yeah. 
until a moment when there is the capacity to distinguish between pleasure and pain, then there is It says there is contact before sexual union, but I don't see feeling put defined separately here. Then desire is the state of one who desires pleasure and sexual union. This is tanha. Then clinging, this is upadana, is the attachment of one who runs around in search of the pleasures. Then he does actions which will have for their result future existence. This is bhava. So here bhava is explained just as in the Pali tradition, the actions that are productive of future existence. And then based on this is jati, which is birth, the new incarnation. And then there is old age and death following upon birth. And then the Abhidhamma Kosha has this division of the twelve factors of Pratitya Samupada into the three groups of defilement, karma, and what it calls foundation. Okay, defilement, the group of defilement or klesha, is, includes three factors. The three factors are ignorance, craving, and attachment. This is in the chart that I gave out last night, the three factors that make up the round of defilements. Then the two factors that make up karma or action are the sankharas and bhava. Again, just as in the chart last last week. Did I say the chart that I gave out last night? Is that what I said? (laughs) The chart that I gave out last week. (laughs) And then what is called foundation here corresponds to the round of results in the Pali tradition that includes the seven factors, consciousness, name and form, consciousness, name and form, six sense bases, contact and feeling. And these are called the foundation because they are the foundation for the defilements and actions. And it also says the parts that are foundation are result. So in fact, what is called the foundation here is the result. And then it says, from defilement, there arises defilement and action. And then from defilement and action, there comes the foundation. And then based on the, the foundation, there comes defilement. And such is the manner of existence of the parts of existence. Okay, so this just shows that the different traditions, even though they're separated by such a vast geographical region, but the way they explain this teaching of dependent origination has so much in common that we can infer that the basic methods of explanation come from a common source and were just preserved and conveyed to these different regions and then elaborated by the teachers in those traditions, maybe with sometimes little differences, but the core principles of explanation are the same. Okay, let us go on now examining the sutta. And we now come to the, we're on page 356 and paragraph 20. This is the forward exposition on cessation. Okay, we, here we have the formula of dependent origination in the way of cessation. After we come to the end of the series on origination, 
with the ori- ori- origination of the whole mass of suffering. Then the Buddha continues, with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of the volitional formations. Then with the cessation of the volitional formations, cessation of consciousness, and so on, going all the ways down to with the cessation of birth comes the cessation of eight with the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Okay, now how to understand this formula on cessation? This is the way I think it should (laughs) really and correctly be understood. What occurs first is the arising of wisdom and true understanding. In fact, there are some suttas and some yutta nikaya which speak about vij upada avija nirujati. That is, with the arising of wisdom or true knowledge, there is the cessation of ignorance. Then, with the cessation, remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, comes the cessation of the volitional formations. Okay, now, within the lifetime of a liberated, enlightened person, when ignorance completely ceases, then there is no longer any creation in that person's mind of new karmic activities. The person, the enlightened person, liberated person, continues to act and there will be volitions occurring in that person. But those volitions don't leave any traces in the mind speaking metaphorically, they do not deposit any seeds of karma with the capacity to ripen in the future. The Dhammapada compares the actions of such a person to the flight of birds across the sky. When the birds fly across the sky, they don't leave any tracks on the sky so that you can trace them and say the birds have gone there, the birds have gone there. It's not like a person walking on the ground or an animal walking through the snow where you can see these are the tracks of the animal or an elephant walking through the jungle. You can see the tracks or the dung of the elephant and see you know The elephant has been walking there. But the bird flies across the sky and there's just no tracks left. And so, when there's no ignorance, there are only good activities, what we would call wholesome activities, but those activities don't leave don't create any karmic formations, any volitional formations. Now, literally, one cannot say that with the cessation of the volitional formations, consciousness in such a person has actually seized right then and there because that person continues to be conscious. But what this means is that this person's current consciousness 
will not give rise to any new consciousness in any future existence. That this consciousness now, because the vo- there is no longer any volitional activities occurring within that consciousness, so it's incapable of propagating itself by giving rise to future consciousness. But literally, what happens with the cessation of ignorance and volitional formations, at the same time, there occurs cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. Those two cessations occur simultaneously with the cessation of ignorance. And then simultaneously with the cessation of volitional formations comes cessation of what's called cessation of being, or I would prefer now cessation of existence or cessation of becoming. This is the cessation of that side of existence in which we create the activities that will produce new existence. And so we actually have in the present five cessations. Okay, so we have five things which actually seize in the present. That's ignorance. Three are defilements. Ignorance, craving, and clinging. And two belong to the side of karma. That is the volitional formations and existence. And then when these seize here and now, then they bring the cessation of the five factors from ignorance through feeling. Uh, They bring the cessation in the future of the five factors from consciousness through feeling. And so we have to, this is the way I understand it, that this series of 12 cessations, one after another, that we find in the formula, or actually 11 cessations, one after another in sequence, this is somewhat of an expository device for showing this, what is in reality, this process by which there is the cessation of defilements, which brings the cessation of karmic activities, which brings the cessation of the results. Okay, at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions on this matter of the cessation, the cessation series. Dr. Murray? uh, If the current uh, consciousness would be uh, rise to a a future consciousness uh, in the future, it, in, in what sense does it follow that there are no volitional acts in, in, the, in the liberated consciousness? In the liberated consciousness? Yeah. You said that there are no volitional, no volitional acts occurring in the present consciousness. And I wonder, 
if you still, if you still make choices in the direction. Yeah, what I said is that the liberated person still makes choices, still has volition, still engages in volitional activity, but this volitional activity does not create any kind of the sankharas are the karmic forces. And so those volitional activities don't set in motion any karmic forces with the capacity to produce new existence. So, so the volitional act, by definition, means karmic, karmic act. I'd say a volitional act is not necessarily a karmic act, but a volitional formation, a sankara, is necessarily karmic. But let us use precise words. The volitional act is chaitana. Okay, now, there can be chaitana volition, which is not sankara which is not creating sankharas. The volitions of ordinary people, unenlightened people, create the sankharas. But the volition of an enlightened or liberated one doesn't create sankharas. Okay, George. Why is birth included in one of the, in the future cessation? Why isn't it? Isn't it? Well, actually, <laughs> one could actually say that birth, aging, and death are included amongst the future. In fact, I'm sorry, that I should have included seven things in the future ce- cessations, but. In this formulaic way of doing it, sometimes it's said that there are five cessations in the present, five cessations in the future, and it's just understood that birth and aging and death are included along with these. This is in the very neat way of grouping them into sets of five. But you're right, for the sake of completeness, completeness, let's put birth, aging, and death here. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Uh, in the discussion of um, um, the practicing to reach cessation, yeah. is there any uh, discussion as to the two defilements, ignorance and craving, yeah. which is more fundamental and which is comes first to be yeah. disrupted? Yeah. Okay, is there any discussion of which of these two defilements is more fundamental? Generally, ignorance is taken to be more fundamental in that craving subsists and continues to thrive because of ignorance. And so to eliminate ignorance, uh, to eliminate craving, one has to overcome ignorance, but often to be able to uncover ignorance, one has to begin by controlling and getting some grip on craving. So that's why one begins with things like sense, restraint, um, training the mind to overcome the five hindrances. And that's a way of dealing with manifestations of craving. Then through insight, one chips away at ignorance until one gains wisdom. Um, I didn't understand what you were saying about the cessation of consciousness. You were saying it, it doesn't really cease? Okay, what I said is that Simultaneously with the cessation of ignorance and the cessation of volitional formations, consciousness itself 
doesn't seize, that is, an enlightened person doesn't have ignorance, doesn't create any more volitional formations, but that person will still be conscious, (laughs) still experiences the world through the five senses, still has a mind, so there's still consciousness there. One doesn't say, as soon as one becomes enlightened, consciousness ceases. And the person will still have mentality, materiality, name and form in that what is form, okay, the four elements, this body consisting of the four elements and the other types of matter and what is mentality, the things like feeling, perception, volition, attention, contact. Those things still occur in the experience of an enlightened person. And they will still have six sense bases, still make contact, still have feelings, pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. But those feelings don't stimulate, they can never stimulate any craving. There'll never be any clinging and never any activities that generate more karma. So the sort of parentheses around some of these things, like the cessation of consciousness, it's really saying the cessation of consciousness that produces karma. Is that remotely accurate? Because, I mean, it clearly says it's cessation of... That's why I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. No, don't be confused. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just a cessation, it's not a cessation of consciousness that produces karma. It's really, it's a cessation of consciousness, cessation of name and form, cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of the sixfold base. But that cessation occurs with the passing away of an enlightened person, a Buddha or an Arahant, when they pass away, then there is no coming back into existence following that final state of consciousness. There's no coming into being of a future moment of consciousness, a future occasion of consciousness. There's no coming into being of mentality, materiality, name and form the sixfold base, contact, feeling. So they don't come into being anymore. But while they're alive, these continue. Yeah. What happens to the, the past karma after cessation? Um, and how does it affect the present life? The past karma what happens to it at the moment of enlightenment? After cessation, how does it affect the life of an for instance? After he passes away? Before he passes away. Before he passes away. Before he passes away, past karma can still mature and can still have its effects. Um, of course, by reason of his virtues and his merits, a lot of the unwholesome karma will be, the karmic obstructions will be counteracted, but still there will be accumulations of past karma from many, many past lives, negative, unwholesome karma, that still will find the opportunities to ripen in this life. The famous example of this in the time of the Buddha was the Buddha's second chief disciple, Mahamogalana, who many, many lifetimes ago had taken the lives of his parents. This was in many, like, world systems ago. And for that, he had been reborn in hell. Then after 
using up a lot of that past karma through that rebirth in hell. He had taken other types of rebirth, but there was still some unwholesome karma which had not yet been exhausted. And that karma remained with him even into his final existence as the chief, second chief disciple of the Buddha gifted, his special gift was supernormal powers, the psychic powers. But when the time for his death arrived, there were a group of thugs or bandits who were plotting to kill him. They were sent to kill him by some rival community, (laughs) rival ascetic community. They were envious of the Buddha, Buddha's success. And they thought that this came because Moggallana used psychic powers to convert people to the Buddha's teaching. So they wanted to get rid of Moggallana. So they sent these thugs to try to kill him. And when Moggallana was aware that they were trying to kill him, he wanted to spare them the unwholesome karma of trying to kill him by using his spiritual powers to escape from them. Not because he was afraid, but he didn't want them to get the unwholesome karma of killing a great disciple. But that unwholesome karma from the past, suddenly it came to the point where it was ready to ripen. And so Moggallana, he was using his spiritual powers and they wouldn't work. (laughs) It was like trying to start a car when there's no gasoline in the engine and the car just doesn't, the ignition just doesn't work. And so he tried and tried, and no success. The thugs broke into his little hut. They beat him to the point where all of his bones were broken. They left him thinking that he was dead. But he had enough strength, they say, to come, to crawl to the presence of the Buddha. Then he sort of paid final homage to the Buddha and then passed away. (laughs) And how is that pain sort of experienced with reference to suffering? How is the pain experienced? Okay, what is said is that the enlightened person, the arhant, no longer has any aversion. So he'll experience pain physically, bodily. That's unavoidable. But that physical pain doesn't arouse any kind of aversion, any kind of grief, sorrow, misery. It's just pure physical pain. Somebody with a certain degree of meditative skill could withdraw the mind from that, but there are limits to one's ability to do that. Even the Buddha himself, when his leg was cut by this Devadatta, his Envious cousin tried to kill him by throwing, hurling a boulder at him. The boulder was deflected, but a chip of stone broke off and cut the Buddha's leg. And so the Buddha experienced very severe pains. So he said that these pains were cutting, acute, severe, taking the life force away but he endures them mindful and clearly comprehending. Okay, I think we should go on. Okay, the section, reverse order questionnaire on cessation, recapitulation on cessation. Go through, they go through this series on cessation, just factor by factor. You can work it out for yourself. Then we come in paragraph 23. This paragraph is intended to show how one who understands dependent origination becomes free from doubt regarding the three periods of time. And here the Buddha is speaking to those who know and see dependent origination. 
So apparently he's speaking to disciples who are at least stream enterers or sotapannas, because those are the ones who know and see dependent origination. And so they would not go back into the past wondering whether they existed in the past, didn't exist in the past, what they were in the past, how they were in the past, and so on. Similarly, they don't go ahead into the future wondering whether they will be in the future, won't be in the future. And they don't have any perplexity about their existence in the present, whether I am in the present, am I not in the present, what am I, how am I, where have I come from, where will I go? And I would understand this freedom from doubt in two ways, or two from two different angles. First of all, all of these types of doubt all center around the idea of, (coughs) excuse me, They all center around the idea of an I, of a persisting I through the three periods of time. An I in the past, an I in the future, an I in the present. And so one who correctly understands dependent origination, the way dependent origination works through the three periods of time, knows that There is no need to posit an I or a self moving through the three periods of time, but rather the round of existence, the course of existence, is just this process of conditionality by which events in the past, factors in the past, condition and produce Factors in the present, factors in the present condition and produce different factors in the future. The factors in the past are the conditions for the factors in the present. They're not the same as the factors in the present, but they're not completely disconnected. But it's through the factor in the past that the factor in the present originates. It's through the factors in the present that the factors in the future originate. So it's through these ignorance and karmic formations of the past that consciousness, name and form come into the present. It's through the consciousness, name and form and all the other states of the present that birth, old age and death take place in the future. In the future, it will be through ignorance, volitional formations, craving, clinging, that will bring about new consciousness, new name and form, and still another future existence. And it will be the ignorance, volitional formations, craving and clinging in that other future existence that will bring about birth, old age, and death in an existence beyond that. And so we can go back into the beginningless past, We could go ahead into the endless future, but it's always these factors conditioning other factors. And so in this way, no self around which it originates, around which everything centers. And yet one understands how these factors of conditioning operate in the past, in the present, in the future. In this way, one is freed from doubt. And then the Buddha, to emphasize, again, the direct experience of the disciples, he says, in paragraph 24, he says, knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus, 
the teacher, that is the Buddha, is respected by us. We speak as we do out of respect for the teacher. The monks say no. And he says, knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The recluse, that's the Buddha, says thus, and we speak thus at the bidding of the recluse, the great ascetic. The monks say no. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you acknowledge another teacher? Could you look at some other teacher as, could you take him as your teacher, one of the other spiritual teachers? The monks say no. Then, he says, would you, knowing and seeing in this way, would you return to the observances, the debates, the auspicious signs of the ordinary ascetics and Brahmins, taking them as the core or the heart of the spiritual life. That is, the other ascetics and Brahmins follow these, sometimes these, what we would regard as these strange observances, like undertaking ascetic practices, fasting for long periods, tormenting the body. In, they engage in these debates, they regard certain things as auspicious signs, all of these practices of <laughs> Indian spirituality. And so the monks say no. Then the Buddha says, do you speak only of what you have known, seen, and understood for yourself? And they say yes. Then the Buddha says that you have been guided by me with this Dhamma, which is visible here and now, immediately effective, inviting invest inspection. That is, it's ahipasiko, something that is to be approached and investigated for oneself. It's openayako, it's something that leads onward. Pachatang veti tabo vinyuhi. It's something to be experienced by the wise for themselves. Okay, now we come to what seems to be a new section of the sutta. But this new section of the sutta, the way I would see it, this is now going to give us a concrete presentation of dependent origination. Like so far, the Buddha has given dependent origination in somewhat of an abstract formula. Is that a question? Did you have your hand up? Uh, a quick question of this previous section. This yeah. Case, uh, having been what, what shall we be in the future and also in the future? Having been what, what we become in the past? What does that mean? Okay, having been what, what did we become in the past? That's like speculating, what was I in some previous life? Then after that life, what did I become in the next life? That's what I think, yeah, yeah. Of course, Buddhists do that too, when they get the power, but this is done through. <laughs> it's not supposed to be done as speculation, but when one gets... Those who develop the divine eye, sometimes they can direct that divine eye to the previous lives. And then one has to be wondering, what was I in a previous life? <laughs> there I was, lived in such and such a form, I ate such and such food, I experienced such and such pleasure and pain. And passing away from there, I was reborn there. And there I lived such and such a life. I had such and such experiences of pleasure and pain. I ate such and such food. Okay, so now we come to the section on the round of existence which shows in concrete form the sequence or process of dependent origination. And this is now going to be explained in terms of the descent of the embryo, how the descent of the embryo takes place. 
And the Buddha here says that the descent of the embryo takes place through the union of three things. Okay, what's called the descent of the embryo, Gabasava Kanti. Okay, so what are these three things? Here there is the union of the mother and father, but the mother is not in season, not fertile. And the Gandhava is not present, and I'll explain this in a moment. In this case, no descent of an embryo takes place. Okay, so here there's no successful fertilization. Okay, the next, here there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, she's fertile, but the Gandhava is not present. In this case, too, there is no descent of the embryo. No descent of the embryo takes place. The third case, but when there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, and the Gandhava is present, through the union of these three things, the descent of the embryo takes place. Okay, now in this passage, the big question is the meaning, the, the meaning of this word Gandhava. What is this Gandhava? And strangely, it's not explained anywhere in the suttas what the Gandhava actually is. And it seems almost as though this idea of the Gandhava was something known and understood in this period, something taken for granted. The word Gandhava in Sanskrit, it's Gandharva, was also used to refer to a class of beings. This was like a class of semi-divine beings which were conceived of as spirits inhabiting forests, inhabiting trees and plants, and also as a type of celestial musician. But Obviously, the Gandhava, the word Gandhava, is not being used here in that sense. Now, Buddha Gosa, the commentator, explains Gandhava to mean the being who is to be reborn. And that seems to be the sense that is intended. This the, the meaning of the word that makes best sense in this context. And so the way I would understand this, the word Gandhava would be, we call it the spirit or consciousness of a being that has passed away and is in a condition suitable for taking rebirth. And it is a being who is karmically connected in some way with this mother and father and is has the right karmic opportunities for taking rebirth under those conditions. Okay, and so if there is the sexual union of the parents, if the mother is fertile, but there's no being who has the karmic affinity, the right conditions for taking rebirth, with rebirth through them, then conception won't take place. And now, I just want to read for you some contemporary cases of people who have had memories of previous existences and of their passing away from the previous life which gives some testimony that supports this meaning of the word Gandhava, which shows the meaning of Gandhava as a being in this what we would call the intermediate state. These are from cases that have been collected 
by a professor. His name is Ian Stevenson. He was at the University of Virginia Medical School, and they had been collected and reported in a book by a British Buddhist writer, his name Francis Story. The book is called Rebirth as Doctrine and Experience. Okay, one case is of a, a private in the Thai army. His name was Private Kiao. Okay, this Private Kiao had said that in a previous life he had wanted to become a village monk, but before he could be ordained, he died of cholera at about the age of 20. He remembered that he had not realized that he was dead, and he tried to speak to his relatives and friends, but he couldn't get through to them. He saw his relatives giving food to monks in his memory. And then one day they held a religious ceremony in Kao's house and the paritas, that is the religious chants, were recited. As the monks stopped chanting and were leaving the house, Kao noticed certain peculiarities about his own body and realized for the first time that he was dead. He then followed the monks. Everything seemed ordinary to him except that he was able to walk through people and as soon as he thought of a place he immediately found himself there. He did not feel hungry He could not remember being angry, but he had seen other spirits angry at living persons who threw stones or spat, since they feared that they might be hit. Okay, so Kiao now is in this, we call this an intermediate state, almost like a ghost-like state. One day, Kiao saw a living woman approaching and felt a liking for her. When she came close, he got into the basket she was carrying. At the edge of the fence around the woman's house, the dog barked at the basket. Cow became frightened. He ran away and hid by a nearby, nearby bridge. He stayed there until dusk, when the woman came out to bathe in the canal. He went up to her and embraced her around the neck. He felt comforted and was no longer afraid of the dog. A little while later he lost consciousness. When he again became aware of his surroundings, he found he was an infant and had been reborn to that woman. <laughs> Okay, there's another case is of a Burmese Buddhist monk, his name is Venerable Usobana, who was born on November 5, 1921 and died in a hospital in Thailand in 1964. He had told Francis Story, the writer of this book, that from his earliest years he remembered his previous life. He had been a land surveyor named Mong Po and had married a woman named Ma Shui Tin. He had one son named Mong Po Min, age three, and they lived in a village in Upper Burma. At the age of 36, he had contracted a severe fever and was sent to a hospital. He remembers going by ox car to the hospital and arriving there during a heavy rainstorm. 
After his arrival at the hospital, he remembered nothing more until he found himself alone in the jungle, feeling horrible, hungry, and thirsty. He was in great distress and did not realize he had died. After about two or three hours, he saw a very old man with a white beard and mustache, dressed in white, carrying a staff. On seeing this old man, his distress vanished. The old man called him by name and told him he must follow him. They entered the village and went to his old home. The old man told him to wait outside by the fence while he went into the house. The disembodied entity waited and the old man emerged again after about five minutes. The old man then said, you must follow me to another house. They went to another house about seven houses away, the house of the village headman. Again the yogi told him to wait outside. The old man came back out of the headman's house about five minutes later and told Usobana to enter. Once inside he told him, You must stay here, I will go back. Then the yogi disappeared. The subject saw people in the house but then remembered nothing more. Meanwhile, his dead body was removed from the hospital and buried. Seven days later, the monks were fed according to custom. That night, his wife dreamed that she saw an old man dressed in white who said to her, I am sending your husband to the village headman's house. In the early morning, she got up and went to the headman's house and told the headman's wife about her dream. The headman's wife said that she too had a dream in which an old man appeared to her and told her he was entrusting Mongpo to her family. He led Mongpo into the house and then disappeared. From that day, the headman's wife became pregnant and in time Usobana was born. At the age of two, he was able to tell her all the above things and they believed that the man he had seen in the prenatal state was the same old man she had seen in her dream and the old man that his former wife had seen in her dream. He recognized all his previous relatives, friends, and property. He even remembered his old debts. <laughs> okay, so it's... Yeah. The name of the book. It's in our library. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, if anybody is interested, the book is called Rebirth is Doctrine and Experience. And the author is Francis Story. It should be available in the USA from Pariyati dot com that's p a r i y a t t i dot com okay i think we have to end the presentation for today if there's any questions yeah suppose the consciousness does not follow or it does not cling to whatever. Yeah. Uh, you see, for example, the woman, the old man. Yeah. What will happen? So he just uh, going here and there, whatever. As long as there is still ignorance and craving within that consciousness and the karma is connecting it to the human realm, it would seem that it's just sort of seeking some, the right opportunity to take a rebirth. So once that right opportunity becomes the right conditions manifest, then the rebirth will take place.
Then how about an enlightened being? What will happen? Then there's no no rebirth will take place. They don't go into that intermediate stage. Then there's there's no consciousness consciousness at that uh, after the uh, death. It said that the enlightened person passes away. What does it say? Apatitena vinyanena, with a consciousness which is not established anywhere. Like the consciousness doesn't get a footing, a grounding in any kind of condition, mode of existence. Dr. Murray. Perhaps you can make a comment on Buddha Rosa. He says that um, the Gandhara is the being that's to be reborn. Um, has he departed then from the metaphysics of Gandhara and which there are no beings? Or any processes that only be- Well, the word being is being. The word being is being used here in this conventional sense. And so the Buddha also, in the conventional sense, uses the word being. And so it's quite correct and appropriate to use the word being in the conventional sense. So one uses (coughs) the idea of processes, factors of existence, when one is speaking in a philosophical, when one is providing a philosophical or phenomenological analysis of what experience consists of, what actuality consists of. But when one is dealing in a description of the conventional world of people, transactions, events, one has to use the language of beings, people and so it's quite correct and appropriate to use such language there's one little problem though with sort of for Buddha Gosa and that is that you see strictly within the Theravada commentarial system, an intermediate state is not recognized. This is like one of the naughty points in the commentaries, the Antarabhava is sometimes really fiercely rejected. And so the Theravada commentarial system works with the idea of immediate rebirth from the death moment of one existence to immediate rebirth. And so this idea of the Gandhapa has to be explained, in a sense explained away as the consciousness of a being who has just passed away the moment before the rebirth consciousness takes place in the new existence. But this seems difficult, I have to say, to reconcile with this idea of a being seeking a new state of existence. And it doesn't seem to agree very well with these actual concrete narrative cases of people who have these memory experiences of passing away, dwelling in this kind of nebulous, intermediate state, but this seems to be definitely an intermediate state, waiting for the right conditions to appear in their village, a town, someplace, where they can take a rebirth. The position of an intermediate state, this was taken by the Sarvastivadas, Sar- Sarvastivadans, And then the other, some of the other Buddhist schools, they would align themselves either no intermediate state or intermediate state. And then each 
side would develop arguments based on their suttas, avidhamma collections. <laughs> but it seems that the empirical evidence, I have to say, goes in favor of the intermediate state. Any further questions? Okay, then we will end for the evening. And thank you all for your attention. And we end by sharing the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang etavata cham hehi sampadang pun yasampadang sabe deva anumodantu sabha sampati siddhya E tavata cha am hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe buta anumodantu sabha sampati sedia E tavata cha am hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata anumodantu